All right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We've got a fun event tonight. We have a tasting of Bourbon Supreme. Should be uh, one that I don't personally know a whole lot about, so I'm glad that Wes is going to be here to educate us on it as well as lead us through the tasting. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Wes Harden. Wes, hey how guys. you doing, man? Doing good. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 Good, good. So yeah, f- feel free. Like I said, if you want to open up your mics, feel free. Uh, ask any questions. Very casual, laid back group tonight. I think this... We should be about uh, where we need to be right here. So cool. So Wes, first of all, I always like to, you know, talk about the the canter itself. Where did yep. you track this one down at, man? So this is one where uh, one of the, uh, had a, there was a guy just selling what he called odd men. So it was a lot of like, uh, it, it's a lot of like 80 proof beam and 80 proof, Ezra and a lot of 80 proof items, but he had this uh, Bourbon Supreme. Here's the decanter here. Okay. So it's actually, it was in 1969, and it's the capital of Virginia, Williamsburg, uh, which is pretty cool. And so I had seen Bourbon Supreme, uh, not decanters, but bottles uh, in on a couple of the auction sites before, and I never really pulled the trigger. They've always been very reasonable, but I just never had pulled the trigger. Uh, and this guy had a really good deal on this decanter, and I thought the decanter was cool, but then obviously it took me down the, the rabbit hole, and I was like, I'm going to grab that, and I think that'd be a good one for the Dusty series because it's something off the beaten path, and it's something outside of Kentucky, uh, which is always interesting to me anyway. Uh, so yeah, just uh, a guy had it and kind of uh, he was just getting rid of quote unquote extras of some things that are relatively pretty cheap and easy to move for the most part. So uh, it was just in a lot of mix of a lot of beam items. He had just a picture of a bunch of things and I asked him to send me a picture of this one and it was not beam. It was a uh, bourbon supreme. So I grabbed it. Yeah, very cool. So should be should be interesting. And the stats on this one is it an eighty proof it, as well? Or no, what? this is no, this is an eighty six proofer. Okay, uh, it is seventy four months, which calculates to like six point two years. So it's a little okay. over six years old. Uh, this thing was a four fifths quart, which was a pretty good size at the time. Uh, a lot of the bottles, uh, a lot of bottles from uh the 50s 60s 70s or four fifth quarts not a lot of decanters are but that one was a pretty uh pretty wide pretty meaty decanter there Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh really cool so i can't remember address wise do we have anybody uh from or that lives in virginia that part of the group tonight we do have some regulars uh, like casey priester is from virginia but he's not here uh okay um Paul is close, right? He's Maryland. He's Mar- I know we have, I think Paul's in Maryland for sure. Yeah. All right. He so shop, he-, he shops Virginia, but uh, yeah. No. It's, <laughs> yeah part, so- it's, part, it's part of his bourbon circle is his hunt that he goes on. So yeah. So if anybody's interested in that decanter, uh, message me behind the scenes and I'll, uh, if you put the shipping on it, I'll just give it to you if anybody's interested in it. So it's a cool little piece. Some people like those things for decoration, some don't, but. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a little over six years old, 86 proof. So it's got a, it's uh, right in that typical 60s, 70s, 80s era. Most everything was 80, 86. You had some oddball 90s and some oddball bonded, but that was about it. So mm-hmm. six years, 86 proof. Very nice. So, and a little bit of the company history. I mean, I, and you said you had some revelations even yeah. late on this one as you, as you dug further into it. Yeah, so... So Peoria, Illinois, uh, was always kind of, that was the really big distillery uh, back in the, back really from pre-prohibition through prohibition and all the way. And I don't want to get too much into the history of that because I want to do a, a, I want to do a Dusty series on uh, one of their labels later on. But when I initially grabbed this, I looked at the uh, distilled, uh, distilled at, and I thought it was going to take me to the, the big Peoria plant, but then I really get the digging into it and I realized it's not, it's Pekin, P-E-K-I-N, Pekin, Illinois. I know, uh, a lot of you guys are neighbors with Illinois and a lot of you, I don't know, some of you may live in Illinois. So. Tim does. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So this is, uh, this is the American distilling company in Pekin, Illinois. So, uh, the early start, oh, it's Jay Peterson's from there, evidently, according to Jade Peterson. Tim. Jay Peterson. So that's interesting. I know he was from there. So uh, back in 1861, so this is, 
this distillery has been around for a long time. Uh, it was started by a guy named, guy named John Wilson. Uh, he purchased what was called the Hamburg Distillery, uh, which was on the original grounds in 1861. Uh, and so early on, they just they they did what everybody did pre-prohibition. There's a combination of some whiskey, uh, some bourbon brands. They had a couple of rye's. They had a ton of blended whiskey, and then they also delved into some other uh, items. They were part of, and I had no idea that there was. Uh, this thing called the Midwest Whiskey Trust. Oh yeah. Uh, so it was, and it was a failed. It was a failed trust. Is actually what it ended up being. It only was around for about eight years. Uh, so there in the Illinois, Indiana, Missouri area, there was uh, there was a group of of guys that decided they were going to drive uh, sales and distribution, and it almost uh, you know they had some kind of. Uh, CD characters, there were some bootleggers involved. There was just all, and they were right there on the Illinois River, which was a main tributary into the Mississippi. And they they tried this trust, which is was basically a whiskey mafia, is whatever they called it. Uh, when you dig into some of the history, uh, and so John Wilson joined uh, towards the end of this, he joined this whiskey trust under this uh, Hamburg Distillery uh, called American Distilling Company. Uh, and long story short, it didn't work out. Uh, a year into it, in 1886, he shut that distillery down, uh, and it kind of set dormant for four or five years. A fire ended up destroying it, and he built a brand new one on the ground. So the distillery that is still standing today uh, really came out in 1891. It was chartered as the American Distilling Company. Uh, Everett Wilson, who was John's son, he was end up he ended up being the first president of the company. Uh, and again, they had a wide array of brands. Uh, I had never really heard of any of these, uh, which is another reason I like the history. I love old brands and old labels. Some of the names are way out there. But uh, if you've ever heard of or seen American Pride, Cologne Springs, uh, Meadwood, Old American Rye, Silver Run Bourbon, that, that those were their main straight whiskeys, whether it was rye or bourbon. Uh, they had probably another seven or eight brands uh, and labels of the gin. And then they had some oddball uh, blended whiskey. Uh, so they were they were going on along pre-prohibition. In 1908, uh, they actually purchased a conglomerate of three other local distilleries. Uh, and what they basically did was bought their labels, bought their stores, shut those down, brought everything in-house into uh, that larger Pekin distillery. And basically what it did, it, it added uh, labels, and then they used those buildings for... Uh, Brick houses and storage, so added capacity as far as storage goes. Uh, during Prohibition, they actually stayed open, but they did not have a medicinal uh, license. They stayed open and made industrial alcohol the hmm. entire time of Prohibition, which is kind of uh, weird. Uh, they reopened after Prohibition with new owners. I, I, I dug and dug and dug. It never really tells who the new owners were uh, that opened it up. At least I couldn't find it anywhere. But after, pre, after Prohibition, they opened up with new uh, owners. And what they did was they're trying to get their brands back into the market. Everyone's trying to run back into the market. Every distilled spirit, every liquor is super hot, you know, coming out of Prohibition. And they end up opening up a New York sales and advertising office uh, so they could revitalize these brands back to the market. Um, and, and so they, they did that. And they ramped up production. Uh, and they got back out on the market and were selling well. In 1954, uh, the plant uh, actually survived. It didn't shut down and it didn't get shuttered, but it survived a huge fire and explosion that killed like three workers, injured several others. Uh, and they just continued making uh, bourbon whiskey and distilled spirits until 1980. Uh, of course, in the, we know in early 80s, late 70s, uh, here come the clear spirits, out go the brown spirits. Uh, we start the, the, the age of uh, the loss of, of bourbon popularity and the whiskey glut. Uh, they were actually purchased by MGP, uh, and they remained open until 2009. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, wow. exactly. So this facility oh, was yeah. making um, different bourbons, whiskeys, gins, uh, after they were bought by MGP in the 80s, they got a lot more into the blended whiskey. They still held a couple of, uh, a couple of, uh, and you'll hear, I'll run through the names in a minute. You'll, I think most people will probably have seen or been familiar with a couple of the brands. The others I had not, I had not heard of. 
Uh, but uh, it remained open until 2009. MGP sold it to a company called Illinois Corn Processing. Uh, and it's still open today. And the only thing they make there is ethanol. Hmm. So they're an ethanol facility. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird, quirky little company that never was really at the forefront. They were never as big as uh, United Distillers in Peoria. They were obviously never um, as big as, as anything in you know Kentucky at the time. But that whiskey trust that they were part of for those eight years, those companies in the whiskey trust were bigger than than what was going on in Kentucky at the time. So they were a portion of that. Uh, some of the brands, obviously Bourbon Supreme, we're going to drink that tonight. Uh, that was one of their straight bourbons. Uh, American Pride Rye. Uh, there was a bourbon. Uh, it was an age stated. I think it was a 12-year age stated called Colonel Hill. I'd love to find one of those. If I could ever run across it, Steve, you'd probably want one as well. Yeah. Uh, there's one called Guckenheimer Bourbon, which I had never heard of. Uh, Meadwood. Uh, I actually have seen a bottle of Meadwood on one of the auction sites. I had no idea what it was, so I passed on it. Uh, but that's interesting. Penny Packer bourbon. I've heard of Penny Packer. Uh, as far as Dusties, especially cheaper Dusties, they're out there quite often. I see them all the time. I really never knew where they came from or who they were. But Penny Packer bourbon uh, is a pretty popular name. Uh, Southern Pride Straight Corn Whiskey was, uh, was another product of theirs. Uh, probably the most popular one outside of Bourbon Supreme was Stillbrook. I think that's still now a blended. I think Bourbon Supreme and Stillbrook are part of Barton now as a blended whiskey or a uh, Everclear kind of deal. Uh, and then they had a large number of blends as well. So they, they never really had um, what I would call like an earth shattering, you know, well-received brand. Uh, they just had a handful of brands that were steady. Uh, they targeted the everyday affordable uh, daily drinker who, um, who was looking for uh, just a, a steady, a steady drink that they could have. And they were very much focused their distribution in the Midwest. That was where they really focused a lot of their distribution. They wanted to, uh, serve their customers in Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, Kentucky, uh, that area. They did end up branching out later in life, especially after when you get MGP and people like that, that buy a, you get a, a wider distribution. But it's kind of a cool little story about this uh, distillery in Pekin, Illinois, of all places that uh, has been around a lot longer than probably people think. Uh, and considering how many bigger brands from bigger well-named distilleries didn't last after prohibition or didn't last after uh, the big four started buying everybody up in, in, in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And it's kind of cool to see uh, kind of what I would call a, a smaller, not well-known company uh, make it that far. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I know we uh, we used to do a show called Bourbon History, and there's an episode on there. If you look on our website, the easiest way to find it, it was part of the ABV Network channel, but we did do an episode on the Whiskey Trust, and that's definitely worth hearing because, as Wes said, ultimately it was a failure. They got into you know, trouble with the government uh, eventually, but for a while they were really dominating it. it they were you know taking over things. They were you know, walk, coming into a town saying, you know, we're going to buy out, and someone would say no, they'd just come in and and kill them and then uh you know and then take over anyway so yeah they were they were doing some some crazy stuff so that's that's an episode worth hearing so uh, either either search on the abv network channel if, uh, podcast or on the abv network website uh, under the the show bourbon history so there's a link yeah. where all the shows are yeah if you like a lot of the history i would uh i would probably suggest uh googling the whiskey trust i cannot think of the guy's name i didn't write it down but there was a pretty well-known uh, during prohibition, even there was a, a, a well-known uh, bourbon smuggler and kind of uh, Illinois version. Um, oh, of uh, help me out, Steve in Cincinnati. Oh, um, Remus, George Remus. Remus, God, I don't know, I forgot that. Yeah, there was. I can't think of the guy's name, but uh, he was to Steve's point. He was famous for. He would just go and kill people. He was tied to the mafia. He was, and I can't not think of the guy's name, but go Google the Whiskey Trust and, and look at that. What I read about it, I immediately thought that would be like a great 
you know, mini series on history channel or like a PBS, you know, documentary or something like it, that whole whiskey trust and what was around it was, was, uh, was pretty interesting. It seemed like anyway, that's what I always said. There should be a cable channel dedicated to bourbon. And, and if you think about it, it could be, yeah, you ever see like back, uh, I don't know, they, there are some podcasts and radio shows that are on TV, you know, like Mike and Mike yeah. in the morning when they used to be on. So you could, you could start out the day with that. And then you could have some documentaries. You could have some, some talk shows where you bring in people like, uh, you know, Eddie Russell or, you know, the nose and you talk to them. And then there could be these movies uh, or another thing. There could be so much program like the food network of the bourbon, like the bourbon network. They really should have that. There's so much out there. I feel. I mean, we're just fans. I mean, even smarter. without yeah. even without new creation, you you could do like YouTube channel kind of TV series where you could do all that. But on top of that, there's there's already enough between documentaries and miniseries and movies based on and around something to do with bourbon, whiskey, and alcohol. And maybe you know to be as big as a TV channel, it has to be alcohol in general. But mm -hmm. you know, you you've got you know, you could do re reruns of Boardwalk Empire. You could do all of those, all the documentaries. You could do all the movies that are tied into bootlegging and untouchables. And there's just so much information out there. I think it would be an awesome channel. Yeah, I do too. I'd sign me up. I would actually uh, get cable back if they have that. <laughs> yeah. So we're, uh, we're going to taste this one now. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's Whatever do it. You guys are ready. All right. Wes, did you cheat and try this beforehand, or are you trying it? With you know, I did not. I, I will say this, that um, I'm always pitching different items and different things for Steve to do um, for the Dusty series. And after it's a, after it looks like it's going to be an event that happens and we start getting participation, that's when I'll start, you know, breaking out and start measuring samples and so forth. But when I first opened uh, the glass container that the guy sent it in, I had this immediate Oh, and I've had it before. I had this immediate, like, I don't know. It was like a weird medicinal smell. And I, and I almost contacted you and said, man, I think we need to cancel this thing. I don't think <laughs> this stuff is any good. But then I'll let it set out in the air for a while and then check back on it a day or two. And it ended up mellowing out. It's just sometimes you get that from those decanters. and The funk, yeah. Yeah, wow. you get the funk. It was weird. The funk. But, uh, no, I have not uh, actually just poured it right before we sat down. On the nose, this one is is solid. You're, you're, you're caramel, but you're also some mint there. I mean, mint mint is not one that I normally get, but I, I'm I'm getting it on this one. Yeah, I get the mint too. Mm -hmm. Brown sugar. Brown sugar. Brown yeah. sugar. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You can, there's definitely a little blue of that. Uh, it's probably that brown sugar. There's a bit of baking spice in there as well. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I get a little bit of a little bit of stone fruit in there too. Stone fruit. I get like a sweet tea. Sweet tea. Okay. All right. Okay. Mr. Bill, how about you there? What do you get on the nose? So you keep nosing. You're looking for something there. He's searching. Yeah. I'm, the biggest thing I'm getting is the, the decanter, you know. The decanter, the, the funk. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm It's been, yeah. I'm trying to get past that. Did you just open yours, Bill? Yeah. Yeah, I give it uh, way after it's open a little bit. It, that goes away after it's open a little bit. Yeah, swirl it just a bit and kind of uh, come back to it here in a few minutes. It'll usually dissipates pretty uh, pretty much. Yeah, it's got a nice color to it. Like I said, six years old, so mm -hmm. you'd expect the uh, nice and dark. Mm -hmm. Nice and dark. It's not uh, just based on the legs. I don't expect it to be a long finish, but I've been surprised before. Yeah. What do you think the Robinsons is your nose in this one? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Robinson. Pretty, pretty much, pretty much <laughs> everything, everything everybody said. And I, I, I get the sweet tea off of that too. Okay. Uh, I took me a minute to get past the ethanol, but it, uh, it's opening up now where I can, you know, you can get to the, a little bit deeper smells. Okay. Rob, you usually got some, some good ones here. So I'm just, I'm just getting the caramel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's got nice caramel to it. Yeah, the, the traditional notes, yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to start drinking this guy. All right, let's try it. Let's try it. We'll talk about it. <laughs> hmm. It's interesting. 
Yeah. I, I was wrong about the finish. It's not super crazy long, but it's definitely not weak or short. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. short -ish. Pretty balanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think like a cherry in it. So as soon as you said that, I always I always like going back and nosing after I take a drink the first time. And as soon as I nosed it at the same time, you said cherry. And that's exactly what I got when I went back in to nose it again. Mm -hmm. Nate, what are you thinking about this one? Well, on the on the nose, it seemed like a chocolate cherry to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I, it kind of tastes more like smoky than I expected. Almost like, I mean, not not smoky like a scotch, but right, definitely some smoky in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nick, what about you? I just opened mine, so I'm still waiting for it to see if I can nose it again, but. I definitely get the cherry and it's almost a, a bit of like a sour cherry, not like strong sour, but it mm -hmm. that's kind of how it first hit me. Like a, like a bear, like a barely ripe cherry kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Savory cherry. Savory <laughs> cherry. Okay. There's such a thing. <laughs> All right. Tim. How about you? You got me puzzled on the mid note because there's that there's that zing, Steve. You're right on that one. Yeah. On the nose. yeah. There's there's a nice little zing there that, that's like a refreshing um, cleanse. It's it's really that's it's really unique. Yeah. Yeah. I've never really yeah, tasted I really that like before. That mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that one. Yeah, I, I get the cherry too. I almost get like a cherry cough syrup type. Uh, uh, it's not yeah, not like, sour, not sweet. like a like a Luden's cough cough exactly. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Then Paul, I think you hit it on the sweet tea. Uh, with that mint though, it's like I'm, I'm leaning towards green tea as well. <laughs> it, that mint note on the nose is really, uh, it's crisp. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, Rob W. I'll get a little tobacco. Mm. Um, I actually got like a, like almost like um, the uh, carrot cake frosting on the back end. Like okay. A, a cream cheese. Cream, cream cheese yeah. frosting. Yeah. Yeah, it just went from caramel <clears throat> to that at the end, and it just—I'm not getting it the second time, but the first time I was definitely had that. Hmm. Minnick gets marzipan all the time. Maybe you're the cream cheese guy. <laughs> <laughs> I will say on the finish, it kind of heats up on on my tongue, kind of across the tongue. It's like it, you drink it, and then it, there's a little bit of delay, then it kind of goes yep. back and forth across the tongue. It's interesting. Yeah, a little bit of spice on the end there. Yeah, Rob B, what what are your thoughts? So mine evolved. At first, I was on the nose. I was picking up a, a weird one. It was kind of like the, you know, the, the the second or third layer of leaves that are sitting on your in your front yard in the fall. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> there's that dampness and there's almost a little mustiness. It's kind of earthy smelling. That's what I was getting originally. But then when I went to sip it and come back to it, it got way different. It got sweeter. The sweet tea was spot on. Um, little zest it almost kind of finishes to me like a like a sour beer almost mm -hmm. uh just a little bit so it changed so much from from sip one and then going back to it yeah yeah what about what you I mike think? oh sorry haven't had my gas camp way in yet. there he is yeah um yeah i kind of caught some of the chocolate cherry up front i was kind of Glad somebody said that because I was struggling with what I was tasting, but that was it. And I, I get a little bit of real faint, like just a little bit of leather, maybe some tobacco kind of at the back. It's kind of the only thing different that I pulled out. But see, Steve, I, I like what you're saying about it. It kind of heats up on your tongue a little bit because it was, mm -hmm. it's almost cool. Like when you first drink it, and maybe right. that's some of that mint zing kind of thing going on. Menthol. Little, yeah, a little, yeah. Menthol, a little camphor. And then it's, then it kind of heats up. But, no, it's it's real enjoyable. It's definitely different. Very enjoyable pour. This is this is good. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah, this. Is, I, I like, this is better I like, than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. I like when we get these surprises like this. That's that's cool. Kent, how about you, man? What are your thoughts on this one? As you had an opportunity to taste through it. Well, I I liked the the dark cherry aspect of it, and mm -hmm. there, there's some other in there that I couldn't put 
my finger quite on. So I decided I was just going to give up and enjoy it. Just enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes really that's what you need to do. That's like, all you know. need to do. Yeah. yeah. I, like I always it. say I'm not a tasting notes guy because I don't like writing tasting notes. Some people like to do that. But I, as a group, I love working with a group. When someone says they find something and then you go back and retaste it, a lot of times it's it's amazing. So uh, the, the legend. We haven't had him chime in yet. Oh, go back to the nose. I, I picked up a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. I was surprised on and the the cherries predominant in the taste. Um, I get a little bit of mint on that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like when you do get a mint note, it's always subtle. I don't feel like it's subtle with this one. It's a little bit different than most. Almost like a cherry. A little bit more bold. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would be willing to bet that this week, these were probably, so it's definitely a high rye mash bill. Yeah. It's not wheat for sure. Right. Uh, and I would say it's probably high corn, high rye, low low barley, because you don't usually with the higher, to me, the higher mash bills that have uh, a higher barley, a ten or twelve percent barley, end up getting more of those. Um, you get like a peanut or like a, a bread or a yeasty kind of mm -hmm. taste. Wow. And I, I would guess that these were probably mid to lower level of the Rick House as well, only because that's where you get. A lot of that, you get the leather, sometimes you get mint, you get, uh, you know, the earthy kind of flavors. And at the higher areas of the Rick House is where I typically find that you get super heavy fruit, super heavy caramel, super heavy, uh, you know, vanilla, brown sugar kind of deal. So just a total guess. But if I had to guess, I'd say it's a high rye, high corn, low barley mash bill, probably mid to lower level would be my guess. Mm hmm Paul, I know we talked a little bit on the nose. What are your thoughts as you taste through this one now? Uh, I think it's got a great mouthfeel. Um, mm -hmm. It no, looks what? thin in the glass, but it, I mean, it's got a great mouthfeel. And I think Mike hit it right on the head for what I'm getting. I'm getting tons of leather and some tobacco. Mm -hmm. There is like a, a stone fruit in there too. It's almost like a cherry tobacco or something, but tons of leather mm -hmm. on the mid palate. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. It's a, it's, a, it's a good surprise. I wasn't, uh, in my research, there was some guy, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, who um, had found one of these and, and did a, re a review in air quotations and just kind of pissed all over it. It was terrible. Oh, it was garbage. It was horrible. And so I was kind of worried. I was like, man, oh, this isn't really bad. But no, it ends up uh, exceeding what I thought it was going to be. So I'm pleasantly surprised with it. Yeah, I get almost what? a swisher sweet. Not a bad thing, but the tobacco and the cherry and mm -hmm. uh, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's a good good tasting note for sure. Yeah, there's still there's still a, a mid note in there somewhere that I've never tasted before, and I can't identify it. It's good, but I can't figure out what it is. Hmm. Keep we'll keep doing some research here. Maybe we'll, we'll come up with it. Maybe we'll come up with it. Well, the, the the sad part about it is I get most of my nosing and my flavor notes after the glass is empty and the glass is oh yeah cleared out for 15, 20 minutes, which doesn't do you any good when you have that little bitty bottle and you drink it all and then <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. the the tobacco. On the dry parts of the glass is really coming yeah. out. Absolutely. Yeah, the tobacco is super prominent after the glass is empty and you kind of go back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Well, Wes, you've uh, you've outdone yourself, my friend. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now this is uh, this is this is one of the the McCormick was a really present supplies because I wasn't expecting a lot out of it, but this one I think is better than that McCormick. It's got a Mm -hmm. it's a it's very yeah. uh, very balanced kind of very unique and interesting i like it this one's pretty high up there i'd say so and i i do have one of these on the way so again we've got a a oh, fan cool. of the show uh brother of uh a baby vinegar or crew club member that's in new jersey collecting all these bottles and one of these is a bourbon supreme so oh, cool. uh, he's got that for me so i'll have i'll have that exactly the same decanter west got and he's got a couple more that he's getting me too so um yeah 
I almost had a Michter's decanter uh, the other day. So there's some guy by me selling a bunch of old decanters and I put in an offer and I thought I was going to get it, but they ended up finding someone to pay more, but it's too bad. I want to, I, I haven't tried any of that old Michter's. I heard it's not great, but I still want to try it because Dick Stoll made it. I want to see, I want to see what the, that stuff was like. It was a, it was a, a Cleopatra decanter, which those are cool. Yeah. I, I, I take people's reviews of bourbon in general kind of. Yeah. I've never Just tried cursory, it myself. So, right, right. But like even Dusty's, like when people kind of say this is this is no good. It's I mean, there's people that have had bonded beam, which is you know, beam dusties are good, but if you can get a bonded hundred proof beam dusty from the 60s, 70s, it's on a different level than than the rest of it. And people have you know, oh, it's it's not any good. It's all, all the all the dusties have that funk and it's terrible. Like, you know, people that have only drank or newer drinkers and have only had the, the super high proof stuff that they have today and, and they're used to that flavor don't i i think they don't take time to appreciate kind of the flavors and the nuances of how they made whiskey in the past so i right i take dusty reviews with the double thumbs down and right the, and, the and they do way. the they do the same thing with uh craft whiskey too because yeah, exactly. again what they're good what they what they do is they they have the ability to read an age statement and that tells them how much they like it so yeah. if it's if it's a 12 year old bourbon they love it especially if it's from a distillery that they know that's a, that's a good bourbon. Not necessarily. Let's uh, again, let's go back by taste and, and, and some of those younger whiskeys. And, and I, I'll tell you what people even like Roy Steele, I've had stuff or, or even Adam Stump, you know, that was less than two years old when we had that bananas foster. That's some of the best bourbon you'll ever drink, man. Uh, you, you can't tell me that. And again, I'm not saying it's better than four roses, small batch, limited edition, but it's pretty unique and pretty good on its own and not to write it off just because it's a younger whiskey. But If you add in the chill filtration as well, a lot of folks are drinking chill filtered stuff. Yeah. They don't have all those extra esters and then, and, and all the stuff that's coming out of the non-chill filtered, all those mm -hmm. extra flavors that they're not used to. Yep. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a big deal on it. So used to having it with on the rocks or, you know, with ice. Mm -hmm. Of course it tastes good when it's watered down to 60 proof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so bourbon drinkers are an interesting group for sure. Yeah. To say the least. But we've got the good people here, right, Wes? That's right. So that's what we get on right. our events. That's right. People that want to try something that you can't have anymore. Well, you can, but not in yeah. mass quantities. Right? We, you know, uh, Royce Neely and I were talking, and we said in 10 years, there'll be no such thing as a, a decanter anymore. And uh, you can't say everything, but people are finding them they're drinking them they're, they're pretty abundant right now but they're, they're, again they're not making any more so yep. each time we crack one of those one more is gone out of the system and that's happening all the time and like i said the, the way bourbon's going now like i said in, in 10 years you just won't be able to find it. it's like it's like 10 years ago you could go into a liquor store it'd be a, a good hobby to go around and find dusties on the shelf and in reality it hardly ever happens these days but uh you know decanters are kind of that 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 area where it's still plenty available right now but as we as we go down the road it's just not going to be the same maybe roy should become the decanter guy and start up the decanter <laughs> yes yeah that'll make the difference <laughs> yeah he could do like uh, Mc, mccormick did with the different elvises he could do a different decanter for all the family members it'd be perfect yeah. i was gonna say a different one for becca sue different oh, God. yeah it's different <laughs> I've I've got a great Royce story. I'll tell when we turn off the recorder here in a little bit. It has nothing to do with Royce, by the way. It's not. It's a shenanigans that happened at his distillery yesterday, and it's a great story. So I'll, I'll tell that. Um, but not not while not while not while we're rolling. So I don't know if he wants to on the record. So on the record, on the record. But it's funny. It's a funny one for sure. You've actually put it on the record by saying we're not going to put it on the record. Yeah, kind of. But it's nothing bad. It's 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 just a funny story, actually. So, but yeah. So I mean, I'd get no trouble if I told it on on here. But hmm, I'm gonna I'm gonna save it. Always save it. So that's why you want to attend the event and then do the after event. Do the after event. And the after event sometimes is better. Yeah, that's like when we had that Greg Snyder on. Anybody who oh. who, who hung oh. up, <laughs> anybody who hung up on when we had oh. Greg Snyder on our flagship whiskey missed. You can't believe the stuff that you missed stories about booker no and just crazy stuff i never heard i've heard i if someone knows booker i want to hear every story they've got and he had ones that i'd never heard before again because and it was all firsthand stuff because he was friends with them so yeah 
So therefore, we're doing that event coming up, Chicken Cock Plus Stories. I just want to get the stories, actually. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's gonna be gonna be amazing. So, yeah, I don't I don't know if he can tell some of them while recording, like like the Roy story. I don't know if he can tell all of them while recording. It might be stick around for the for the show after the show again when we talk to Greg Snyder because uh, there, there could be some good ones he holds back. So I'll have a five minute show and the rest will be after. There you go. <laughs> yeah, the oh, after party. Like, yeah. Sorry if it's sample so we can get to the after. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Here's everybody. Introduce everybody. Okay, now we're up there. Okay. Now let's... we're up there. Let's 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 get to the real stories. So yeah. Good stuff. Well, Wes, you've got one coming up too. You've already got uh, JW Dant uh, scheduled for April 20th. Tell us a little bit about what, what to expect on that one. Yeah, so uh a the Dant family history is dance are one of the, uh, to me, they're one of the iconic bourbon families that probably almost more so than any other bourbon family were at the, the, the top of the food chain at one time. It had all these different branches, not as many as the bean, but they were there. And then through bad times and bad choices and family members not wanting to stay into the get into the business and stay in the business and people branching and and they literally you know we'll get into it but they they went for a long time they literally had nothing in the industry and then obviously uh you know steve beam comes back Steve beam and those guys come along and now you know wally wally and, those, wally yeah. and that group are, group are building uh thank goodness they're they're building it on the ogesamine uh, site the resurrecting slash building that distillery that's uh, cool yeah cabin still on that guessing site so i'm a big huge huge fan of the the, the dant family history that was actually I'm pretty sure it was the first article i wrote for the whiskey corner blog in relation to old old labels old uh, bourbon families i wrote that almost three years ago now four years ago uh so i'm big into that so there's always this thing with, and it's, this is this event's not so much about Dan. It's really about Heaven Hill and their '96 fire. So uh, the the bourbon geek world are big into pre-fire Heaven Hill products. Anything that people can find, if they want to find a Heaven Hill Dusty, a it's a it's going to be pre-fire because most of them are before '96. But there's this whole deal where. You know, everyone says Heaven Hill's totally different being distilled at Bernheim versus on site in the old uh, DSP 31 at Heaven Hill, which is now uh, the distillery was burnt. So uh, I searched and searched and searched, and uh, we're going to do a blind tasting. And it's going to be and what I like about this one is it, there's no difference in the proof. These are the same products, but one was distilled at the old 31 distillery, which would be pre fire. So it was distilled at the uh, it's a distillery there at Heaven Hill. And then the other is just a regular uh, current JW Dant. They're both four year, they're both bottled and bond. Uh, and we're going to do a blind tasting and see if we really can pick out a distinct difference uh, in whether pre fire is A, drastically different, and B, dramatically better, which a lot of people claim it is. I personally don't know. I've never done, I've never completed a, of any Heaven Hill product, doesn't matter what it is. A lot of the labels and brands pre-fire aren't around anymore so elijah craig was but it's not 12 years anymore mm -hmm. you know, it, right. it's barely six years now so uh so you can't do elijah craig uh you can do melo corn if, if you get if you really want to if you really want to yeah if you want so i thought about doing that because i do have a pre-fire uh, mellow corn but uh i wanted to to present it to the masses not everybody likes corn whiskey i get it uh so i i finally found a pre-fire uh dant uh so we're gonna see what this whole pre-fire craze is about that's cool we may end up putting it to bed and say it's much ado about nothing or we may be fans where we can only drink pre-fire or oh, we may say you know what we may we're, be screwed we're on the hunt for pre-fire <laughs> yeah uh and also just a note again the focus is on the, the whole pre-fire post-fire thing but but again there is that family history of dant and i know tim dant signed up for it so a dant family oh, member did sign up for it so i just guess he just saw it listed and wanted to see what's going on so yeah and i know when you wrote that article about dant one of your early ones you talked about the dant family reached out to us and loved it and uh yeah, yeah. So they 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 closely follow what uh, what's stated out there about the family. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm exciting. I'm excited about the new uh, distillery. That's going to be a it's a big deal. That uh, that old Gessamine distillery. I have had uh, 
60s JW Dant. And back then it was like an eight year bottled and bond from the Gessamine. And it's, I mean, it's premium. Like they, they, that, that particular site and that distillery made some amazing products. So uh, that was before Heaven Hill bought the brand and, and took it over to, to Heaven Hill. That's uh, back when Dant was its own company, its own product, its own distillery uh, on the Gessamine site there. So I'm hoping that they can recreate some of that magic here in a few years with the, uh, the, the what do they call it? The old cabin, uh, the old, uh, what's the name of the, the new distillery? Old log still. Oh, yeah. Still. Yeah. Log still. Log still. Yeah. 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 So that's interesting. And then you've also got one coming up right after father's day. So it's a new thing that again, we're only a year into this, uh, you know, this online stuff. And we found last year at Christmas, we put out a couple of these events targeted towards give it as a Christmas gift. We'll do it right after Christmas. That way you give them, you know, a certificate or whatever. And, and then shortly thereafter, they get the tasting. You can give them the actual samples and they ended up being so popular. Uh, and again, they didn't sell early. They sold as we got to, you know, early, you know, mid, mid November on, uh, at first I didn't think they were going to sell at all. I thought, well, I don't know, you know, do we do these really special spectacular ones? And then, then I, I sold out two of them, like, like a snap of a fingers. And then everybody wanted more. I was like, I, should I put more? I don't know. And I didn't. And then I got so many emails. People begged me, do, do one more. I, I got to give this as a gift. Why, you know, could, could you get me in put me on a waiting list? Well, there's only, you know, you're limited to what you can do with these based on the amount of whiskey that you have. There's no, okay, we can squeeze you in. Well, there's no whiskey for you if we squeeze you in. So uh, we learned from that. So we're doing a special one. Uh, we're going to do two. I'm going to do another one after Father's Day too. But Wes, you're leading one of them after Father's Day, which is a pretty special one with five different bourbons. Two of them are, are Dusties, all at 80 proof. And we're going to kind of see if we can compare on a blind taste test, old Dusties versus new 80, you know, eight, that's Dusty 80 proofers versus today's 80 proofers and see if, if we can tell a difference. That'll be pretty fun, don't you think? You there with me? Yep, I'm here. Uh, oh. Is that for the group or for me? That was for I you. think it's cool. I think. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's cool. So there's uh, again the the craze now, and I like it too. The craze now is super high proof. Anything under you know barrel proof or 100 proof is is no good. It's garbage. I contend uh, to keep your palate fresh and make sure you don't burn out. You need to mix 86 and 80 proof and 90 proof into your whiskey diet, as I call it. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, we're not naming any of the names ahead of time. It's going to be a true blind. I'm going to be the only one that knows. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to sample five blind. Uh, it's going to be three, what I call modern day uh, 80 proof bourbons and two dusty 80 proof bourbons. And so we're going to be able to compare a few things. One, how do they all stand up against each other? Uh, is anybody, is anybody able to guess what is what? Because, uh, we're, we're going in blind, but we're actually going in double blind because uh, the audience has no idea what these are. Right. I mean, just pick your 80 proof bourbon. It's a crapshoot. It's, it's it, everyone's will be the same, but we have we'll, no idea what they're going to Yeah. Be. We'll try to do, tr try to do several things. First of all, can you pick the dusties? Right. Uh, the, the, we'll also do, can you tell what, what brands these are? So, so again, that's another, another whole offshoot of this. And then too, just because you can tell them apart, you say this one's dusty. Well, does that doesn't mean you like it better? Then it's going to be, what do you like better than? Do you like the, 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 the dusty stuff or do you like the newer, uh, you know, 80 proof bourbon? So it'll be, a, it'll be a fun event, a lot going on with it. And, uh, I think it'll be a very enjoyable session for sure. So that'll be a good one, Wes. Yep, I'm excited about that one. It's going to be cool. I think we're going to we're going to try to pull the stigma off 80 proof bourbons. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else that you need to talk about on this one, Wes? Before we wrap her up? No, I'm good. I want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, does anybody have any questions, requests, comments, concerns, critiques? Let's have them. Thanks for sharing this with us. It was good. It was good. Oh, thanks for joining in. That's, yeah, what, that's what it's about. I like. Uh, I loved, I mean, I still like modern bourbon, but I don't chase much besides dusties and store picks anymore. Yeah. Um, and so if I can find something that I haven't had, or even if I've had it and I can get it and we can offer it in as part of the club to everyone, uh, there's just something about drinking something that they don't produce anymore. And I mean, these things are 30, 40, 50 years old. So yeah. um, it's a, it's a cool thing, especially if you're, if you're a bourbon lover, I think you have to, 
um, like and respect the history. And I like digging into, I, I like doing the homework as much as anything else, just so I can learn more about the, the brands and the history. So I enjoy that portion of it. Yeah. Yeah, the blind tasting sounds really cool. Yeah, yeah. it's the only way to go. Just do a blind tasting. And, yeah. uh, you know, if we did, a, I thought about doing, okay, we could do a mix of 80, 86, 90 proofers. At some point, it'll be easy to tell the difference between uh, those the proofs. Just, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. proofs, but let's just make them all 80 level playing field. Let's, uh, let's see what comes out and uh, see who's good at guessing 80 proof uh, bourbons and which one's a dusty and which one's not. Yeah. Cool. cool. All right. Any other questions? Anything you, uh, Wes needs to be on the lookout for? Anything that you feel would be a good one of these type of events? We need to get Wes tracking down. That corn whiskey sounded really good, Wes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm all for it. It's setting it's setting and waiting. All I need to do is uh, get with Steve and pull the trigger. I know Steve Steve and I are corn I, whiskey guys. Yeah, I like I like corn whiskey. So I like yeah. corn. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, good. Hey, well, uh, Steve, I'll get with you. We uh, we'll put that out there, and okay. I don't care. I don't care if we get five people. I, it's mm -hmm. worth doing. Just uh, I think everybody would be pleasantly surprised uh, with the corn whiskey. And there's uh, I don't know. We'll see. I may not even do a dusty versus a normal today. What I may do is uh, we may do a blind uh, two different uh, corn whiskeys that aren't. Uh, modern day mellow corn. So hmm. grab a couple that are a little bit off the beaten path. They're, they were popular as corn whiskey, but if you're not a corn whiskey person, you may not know them. So yeah, I'll get with you, Steve. We'll do something like that. I think the corn whiskey is uh, it's a cool product. Yeah, sounds good. All right, well, with that, I will uh, say goodbye and we'll turn off the video. I'll stick around for a little bit and, uh, and talk about bourbon if anybody would like to hang out. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. Thanks, Wes.